This is a conference which is held here at the National Naval Medical Center once every two weeks. And the format has generally been that two or three hearts are presented to me as unknowns. And I look at the hearts as unknowns and try to predict the patient's age, sex, and, and to some extent the uh, clinical information. I prefer doing it this way because I believe it makes me at least uh, look more carefully uh, at the anatomic specimen without uh, too much uh, uh, clinical uh, prejudice. The first case here is, is a heart that has been opened uh, previously, and the major finding is uh, left ventricular hypertrophy with a normal size left ventricular cavity. Uh, there's no scarring in the uh, myocardium at all, no foci of necrosis. Uh, the other uh, observation of note here is the considerable amount of subepicardial adipose tissue uh, in this heart, particularly in the AV sulcus. Uh, there's always more fat in the AV sulcus than any other portion uh, of the heart. Uh, in this particular specimen, there's also some fat visible, however, on the endocardium uh, here in uh, right atrium, uh, for example. And and probably in some areas of right ventricular endocardium, although I don't see that right off the bat. Uh, the coronary arteries contain uh, quite a few atherosclerotic plaques. I think the left circumflex at any rate is greater than 75% narrowed, uh, probably also um, uh, the left anterior descending. So I do think that this uh, patient did have uh, uh, was likely uh, uh, died as a result of uh, coronary atherosclerosis. I haven't gone over these coronaries extremely carefully, but, but uh, every five millimeter segment contains atherosclerotic plaque, and I think that at least two of the three major coronary arteries are greater than 75 percent narrowed. Uh, the uh, thickening of the wall here makes me believe that this patient uh, had systemic hypertension. Uh, the, the general extent, the general appearance of this heart makes me believe that this was a relatively young person, I would say a man about uh, uh, 40. Uh, there is uh, some placking in the ascending aorta uh, quite a bit, that's not, you can't see that on uh, film. And whenever I see a lot, uh, quite a bit of yellow atherosclerotic placking in ascending aorta, uh, at least I think of type 2 hyperlipoproteinemia. I think there's no question now that patients with type 2 hyperlipoproteinemia have more atherosclerosis in ascending aorta than do persons with uh, other types of hyperlipoproteinemia and those individuals with uh, normal lipoprotein patterns. So I would think this patient either died suddenly, uh, and this was this patient's first coronary event, it's certainly conceivable that this uh, individual, who I predict would be a man, uh, ha had previous angina pectoris. But usually in angina, there is some scarring somewhere in myocardium, either pap muscles or other portions of LV free wall. Whereas in this uh, heart, I don't see any scarring at all. That makes me suspect that this was a sudden cardiac death, and the sudden uh, coronary death was the first manifestation or the first coronary event in this particular person. The other thing which is uh, conceivable is that this patient did not die from a cardiovascular event, at, a cardiac event at all, but died of a stroke. Uh, patients with systemic hypertension without dilatation of the left ventricular cavity, in other words, that do not have congestive heart failure, uh, this is a setup also for them to die of stroke. So I would think this is a young person, 40, let's say, man, who either uh, died suddenly and unexpectedly uh, from presumably ventricular arrhythmia or uh, uh, had a uh, sudden stroke, presumably intravascular, uh, intracerebral uh, hemorrhage. What information uh, do you have? Well, indeed, this was a 42-year-old male who was apparently in good health until noon on 19th of November, 1974, when he developed the sudden onset of a left hemiparesis a left hemianesthesia and later on a severe headache 
over the next three to four hours, the patient's neurological status decreased progressively to coma and eventually to bilateral decerebrate findings. Angiography did show a large intracerebral hematoma involving the right parietal temporal area. Emergency decompression was done and the hematoma was evacuated. The surgery also included uh, necessarily a right temporal lobectomy. Uh, he remained essentially decerebrate for several days, requiring uh, support for his respiratory and blood pr respiratory function and blood pressure. Um, five days post-operative, he uh, met the criteria for a neurological death and was uh, pronounced dead. Do you have any information regarding his blood pressure during life? Yes, uh, we have some very unclear history. Um, he has not really been documented as having systolic hypertension, although he was recorded um, as having two, two blood pressures, one on his initial physical examination approximately 20 years ago and one approximately 11 years after that with uh, blood pressures in the range of 160 over 90. His wife did give a history uh, of 20 years duration of systolic hypertension, which was apparently untreated. We don't have the documentation. Well, this is obviously a classic case. This is a complication of systemic hypertension. Intravascular hemorrhage in a 42-year-old man, uh, if you can rule out trauma, uh, is almost always a hypertensive catastrophe. If we did away with hypertension, we would do away with the majority of strokes in this country. Uh, certainly the younger, the hypertensive strokes classically are the, uh, are the bleeding ones, the intra cerebral hemorrhage, uh, but uh, the intracerebral necrosis without hemorrhage, the infarction type, is also, in my judgment, most commonly a consequence of hypertension. They are not very frequent in patients without left ventricular hypertrophy. In patients with hypertension who develop congestive heart failure, strokes are extremely uncommon. Uh, in other words, strokes occur while the blood pressure is up, uh, not after the blood pressure has come down, let's say because of uh, congestive failure, for example, unless the failure is of renal origin. Uh, good myocardium, vigorous heart, death from a stroke. The, the blood pressures, I mean the blood vessels are not, are made for a certain blood pressure and when it gets over that, complications occur. Any man who has a blood pressure at age 20 or at age 30 of 160 over 90 should be treated or that man is going to end up in a situation like this, either a stroke or a sudden cardiac death or angina or myocardial infarction. Uh, the greatest risk factor of all in, in, the, in the world that we live in, in the country that we live in, is hypertension. We don't know whether or not yet, we don't know, whether or not lowering of cholesterol will prevent or, or delay the development of atherosclerosis, but we know clearly now that, that lowering one's blood pressure will decrease the frequency of, of, of stroke, of dissecting aneurysm, uh, and although the information is not as clean in myocardial infarction or sudden coronary death, uh, I have a strong suspicion that it, with time, the information will be clean uh, there as well. Uh, hypertension is the, is the easiest treatable cardiovascular disease and only something like 15% of the people in this country who have hypertension are being adequately treated. Only 30, 30 out of 100 are being treated at all and only half of them are being treated adequately. So that is not a brain death, that's a hypertensive death. Yes, sir. Uh, for the benefit of some of the residents here and those probably viewing this uh, videotape, what uh, criteria uh, do you prefer when we, when we diagnose a hypertensive heart? Uh, there was some discussion over this at the Gross Conference today, and um, I personally felt, did not feel this was really that uh, marked of a hypertensive heart. How much did the heart weigh? It was 360. And how much did the patient weigh? He was a good 160, 170 pounds. And the left ventricle was how thick? I averaged it at 1.8 centimeters, which as far as I, I was under the impression that was really a borderline measurement. Well, I think borderline, I mean measurements uh, of wall thickness 
is somewhat variable. But this is a thick LV in any book that I'm aware of. And 1.8 is, is, is pretty clear hypertrophy unless, uh, unless the man is a monster, in my opinion. I, I think 1.5 has been used as a demarcation point uh, for a long time in many centers. Uh, I've certainly seen walls thinner than 1.5 cm thick, that is left ventral, and still the, the heart was uh, bigger than normal. For example, in uh, uh, idiopathic cardiomyopathy of the ventricular dilated type, the wall is often not thicker than 1.5. It's thinner than that, but yet the heart may weigh 500 grams. So thickness is a relative thing. The, the elongated bicep muscle may be stronger than the muscle-bound biceps muscle. But this heart, to me, is, uh, is certainly a, a hypertrophy left ventricle. Uh, weights are relative things, but, uh, but uh, it's, it's always nicer in a man to, to say, hyper, to say a cardiomegaly when the weight's greater than 400 grams. But I've seen a heart of a woman that weighed, the heart weighed 280 grams, and she was known for many, many years to have a blood pressure, something like uh, uh, 240 over 140. So its weight is not entirely uh, proportional, but, uh, but this, this, un, this is left ventricular hypertrophy, and I think under the microscope, these myocardial fibers will be quite big. One other problem that um, occur, uh, came up during the conference was that of uh, a heart which in which the patient uh, died and the heart was in systole. Is this, is this a problem in defining the thickness of the myocardium? Yeah. Well, I never know that. I never know what cycle death occurs in. Uh, I'm always impressed by the pathologist or who el else says that this heart obviously uh, died in systole, this one in diastole. Maybe that's the case. I think that's just... That's, those are the kind of judgments, though, that would not hold up in court. Uh, those are impressions. And uh, I would, uh, I would uh, if I was a betting man, I'd bet this heart died in Sicily. But that and 15 cents will buy you a cup of coffee. I mean, you just can't prove that. I just, there's no information on that as far as I know. Any other cu questions, comments, answers? Okay, next case is... Um, a little different. This is uh, a vegetation right there. Now that is on the uh, non-coronary cusp of the aortic valve. The non-coronary cusp is the only aortic valve cusp which has no contact with myocardium. Its, its base is entirely the anterior mitral leaflet, which is this which is obviously continuous with the aortic valve. It's continuous entirely with the non-coronary cusp. It's continuous with a portion of the left anterior cusp here. And it's continuous with the right anterior cusp via the membranaceous septum, which is right there. Maybe you can see light through that. I don't know. Through the membranous septum. I don't guess so. The unusual feature here is uh, is that there's a vegetation which is quite sizable actually on the non-coronary cusp and no vegetations on either of the other two. Usually if you have a vegetation on aortic valve, it's on, uh, uh, it's on all three cusps. There are many exceptions to that, but in general, that's a general rule. The other thing about this heart is this is a heart of an old person. Uh, anytime the ascending aorta has a larger circumference than the longitudinal length of the left ventricle. That's old age. In other words, you've got an atrophied heart and a dilated aorta. Uh, that's, wh that's what happens to us as we go, grow older. The, the heart gets smaller because all our striated muscles are getting smaller, so the heart doesn't have to work as much to get blood uh, to the striated muscles. On the other hand, the elastic fibers in the aorta are wearing out, just like the elastic fibers in the dorsal aspects of our hands. We, we lose that elasticity. Uh, the aorta loses its elasticity and dilates out. So this is a cachectic heart, or, or old age heart at any way. Uh, there no, there's no scarring in this myocardium, no foci of fibrosis or necrosis. The coronary arteries are magnificent. 
Uh, look at that. They look like baby carnea arteries. I uh, hope mine look like that. The left atrium is dilated. The left atrium always gets a little bigger as we grow older. The LV gets smaller. The left atrium gets bigger. The aorta gets bigger. Uh, the right ventricle uh, doesn't necessarily get bigger, although uh, 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 so-called senile emphysema is very common as we get older and it may cause a little dilatation of RV. Actually, there's a vegetation, I don't think I can demonstrate this, on one of the pulmonic valve cusps right here. So that's a vegetation on the right side, also on the aortic valve. Better check this tricuspid valve. Tricuspid valve is okay. The mitral valve is okay. Quite a bit of fat on this heart, very yellowish fat. Uh, I would wonder if this patient had not, look at all that fat, this covers the RV completely. I would wonder if this patient had not been treated with steroids, corticosteroids during life. That's a lot of fat for an older individual. Uh, we all get more fat as we grow older, but uh, this, is, this is an excess amount. And there's no question, this is quite a bit of fat here at the, at the LV apex, the sort of apical fat pad. Uh, I'd say this is an individual that's 80 years of age. Uh, that had maybe uh, 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 lymphoma or leukemia or something like that and was treated with corticosteroids or cancer of the prostate or something like that. Uh, and then as a terminal event, developed this uh, endocarditis. Now, I would predict this to be non-infective, particularly since it's on the pulmonic and aortic valve. There's a little one on the aortic valve, so I would put this in the category of non-infective uh, endocarditis. Another na other names have been used for that is so-called moranic endocarditis. I don't like that term because I've seen it in a 17-year-old and that's not, moranic means old age. Uh, so that doesn't necessarily follow. Uh, some people have used the term non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis. I don't like that term particularly because of, uh, fungal endocarditis could still be in there. Uh, but at any rate, uh, this is not an uncommon observation at necropsy. It is uncommon to see it on pulmonic valve and aortic. It's uncommon to see it just on one of the three cusps. The coronaries are clean. The muscle looks good. There's a lot of fat. I don't think this patient died of a coronary death, of a, of a heart death. I would think that it was a non-cardiac, and I, I would uh, predict off the cuff it was lymphoma or something like that, and I would be strongly suspicious that maybe this patient was treated with corticosteroids during life. This was a 63-year-old uh, white woman whose major, 63, huh? whose major disease was uh, chronic alcoholism with subsequent Lenex cirrhosis, and indeed she died in hepatic encephalopathy and hepatorenal syndrome after about a four-month illness in the hospital. The uh, the interesting thing in her past history that really brings this heart to this conference is the fact that at, at age uh, 20, back in the uh, early 30s, she allegedly had an episode of uh, subacute bacterial endocarditis secondary to uh, uh, leg vein uh, thrombophlebitis. And really at Gross Conference, we were wondering whether this might be an old sequelae of that, of that event. What, this vegetation on the aortic valve? Oh, I think that's recent. I would bet that's recent. I don't see any heel lesions anywhere on valves. Ah. Was she obese? No, it's not at, not at autopsy. She was uh, really cachectic. Only weighed about 85 pounds, and at least 20 pounds of that was acidic fluid. Oh, my goodness. Well, how do you explain all the fat? Was she treated with corticosteroids at any time? No, she was not treated at uh, corticosteroids at any time in the, yeah. uh, in the past that, that we have history of. Uh, it's not really known what her uh, uh, pre-illness weight was exactly. Uh, w do you think this is infective endocarditis or non-infective? No, we didn't think so. We thought it probably was, you know, the uh, 
so-called moratic endocarditis, but uh, we mm -hmm. wondered whether, you know, whether this was a, a lesion that had occurred on an old, on, an, on another old valvular lesion. Uh, certainly, um, uh, emaciation does not prevent fat deposition on the heart. Quasha core, as I understand it, uh, may, those uh, patients still may have a lot of fat on the heart, even though they are starved to death, so to speak. Uh, here, we certainly have a lot of fat on the heart in somebody who's starved, who's uh, emaciated. The coronary arteries are clean as a whistle, and that's an old observation that, that the coronaries and aorta stay pretty clean in patients who have alcoholism, which leads to cirrhosis. If you're an alcoholic that, and do not get cirrhosis, on the other hand, I have a suspicion that, that atherosclerosis is accelerated, maybe. Uh, but if you get cirrhosis, it keeps the coronaries clean. That's, an, that's a well-known observation. William Mannion uh, over at AFIP uh, made that observation in a number of cases. Uh, it seems to hold up. But why it is, uh, I don't know anyway. Anybody have any ideas? How about the role of uh, estrogens? You know, men get gynecomastia. Is there any evidence that suggests they play a role? I don't know. I'm not certain that if you give uh, animals estrogen, you, you produce atherosclerosis or yellow streaks or I mean, uh, prevent, other things in them. You prevent it. Uh, I mean, prevent it. Uh, I don't know if that's been done, put the animals on a atherogenic diet and then at the same time maybe uh, give them estrogens. I don't know about that. It's actually pretty interesting. Well, this is common, but, but it's still there's no explanation for this uh, non-infective endocarditis. It's commonly observed at necropsy. Occasionally these things may break off, dislodge, and uh, lead to a stroke in a very debilitated person. Uh, that is uncommon, though. Do you want to dis discuss this other pa patient, uh, the young? Yeah, uh, I've been told a little bit about this next patient, so this one will not be observed entirely as an unknown, but maybe you can go ahead and give the history on this individual. This is a fairly involved history. This was a 32-year-old black female who was wow. referred to um, the National Naval Medical Center from Fort Jackson, South Carolina, for consideration of aorto-coronary bypass surgery. Her history uh, maintained that she had been in good health until the spring of 1974 when she first began experiencing nocturnal angina. In May 1974, she suffered a severe episode of this chest pain and was hospitalized in a civilian facility and apparently uh, suffered a cardiac arrest at this time. She recovered from this episode and uh, was discharged from the hospital. She continued to have nocturnal angina and was again hospitalized, this time with EKG evidence of an anterior lateral myocardial infarction. Following discharge, she continued to experience chest pain and was referred to the Naval Hospital in Portsmouth, Virginia. She was treated prior to her transfer with nitrates and enderol without significant relief. Anginal pain apparently continued during the hospitalization in Portsmouth, and she un eventually underwent cardiac catheterization on 7 August 1974. This study showed hypokinesis of the anterior left ventricular wall with dyskinesis of the left ventricular apex. Coronary arteriography performed simultaneously demonstrated a normal main left coronary artery, a normal left circumflex coronary artery, coronary artery and only minimal luminal irregularity of the right coronary artery. However, the left anterior descending coronary artery was almost totally occluded, uh, they estimated 90% at that time, at the level of the first septal perforating branch. But the left circumflex and right were clean. That's correct. No lesions. That's correct. And the main left coronary itself was, was open. So single vessel disease. Correct. Single focal vessel disease. Following discharge uh, from the Portsmouth uh, Hospital in September, she continued to have increasingly severe chest pain, again, principally nocturnal and variably relieved by nitroglycerin, and on several occasions she had experienced uh, chest pain, which apparently continued through the night, unrelieved. 
it is of interest that uh, only about 20% of her chest pain, at least it was estimated from history, that 20% of her chest pain occurred with any activity during the day. Her family history was uh, very vague, but her father apparently died of a congestive heart failure from whatever cause. Her mother is living and is describing, described as having hypertension and diabetes, diabetes mellitus. There's no other family history in the siblings or close relatives consistent with premature coronary atherosclerosis. There is also no history of hypertension in this patient or any of her siblings. Physical examination. And no history of diabetes in this patient. That's correct. So this particular patient had no risk factors, is that right? Uh, not entirely. Uh, we're just getting to that. She oh, did I'm have, uh, in the Portsmouth admi uh, hospital mm -hmm. admission, she uh, had a serum lipoprotein electrophoresis, which at that time showed a type 2. I see. We uh, repeated that both uh, pre-mortem and post-mortem on this patient, and it was uh, normal. The lipoprotein pattern That's correct. here? Correct. Do you have any, what were the cholesterol values done there? Do you have uh, I don't that have information? Me, no. Cholesterol here, the cholesterol values at Portsmouth? Yeah. I don't have those. Or here, what were they here? Here they were normal is all I know. I haven't got the, the uh, figures with me. As far as the normal, physical exam, no, I don't mean to interrupt you. Normal to me, normal in Japan is 160 to 180 milligrams per cent. Uh, if, a, if a cholesterol, in my opinion, is over 200, it's abnormal. Now, in this country, uh, uh, that's not considered abnormal. But I think we're talking about average rather than normal. So it's like, it's like blood pressure. I think the number there is, is very useful. Triglyceride over 200 or cholesterol over 200 is abnormal as far as I'm concerned, although that's not a universal opinion. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, as far as the pertinent physical findings, she, her blood pressure on admission was uh, within normal range and had been recorded in the, her several previous admissions as being normal. Um, examination of her heart revealed the PMI to be in the fifth intercostal space. She had a normal first heart sound, uh, a normal second heart sound, which was split physiologically. She did, however, have a grade two uh, mid-systolic murmur, which was audible at the left lower sternal border without radiation, apparently. Chest x-ray showed a normal-sized heart. Uh, we mentioned the lipid profile, consistent with a type two. Here, her, her routine uh, laboratory workup was really within normal limits. Well, what we found at autopsy, this patient, I should say, give her a hospital course, I guess. The, uh, the patient did undergo uh, saponous vein aortic coronary bypass. Um, flow rates were measured on the table at the time of surgery, and the peak flow was uh, estimated at 200 mils per minute, with a mean flow rate of 140 milliliters per minute. Her bypass time was 58 minutes. No complications were apparent during the procedure. However, difficulty, uh, no, no difficulty was, was uh, seen in bringing her off the pump. She, she re, uh, de or defibrillated on her own, established a normal cardiac rhythm on her own. However, as she was being transferred from the operating table to a, a transportation stretcher, she went into ventricular fibrillation. Uh, they reopened her chest. She was given cardiac massage, uh, multiple drug regimen, uh, multiple electrical defibrillation procedures, etc. cetera. Uh, she uh, underwent this uh, attempts at resuscitation for over six hours on the operating room, or in the operating room. Finally, she uh, obtained a minimal acceptable cardiac output. I'm not sure what that really is. But she did get off the table and died approximately 15 minutes later in the uh, recovery room. Now at autopsy, in spite of what the angiographic evidence was at Portsmouth, we found uh, near total occlusion of her right coronary artery. The rest of it you might describe to the, wow. the audience. Yeah, I certainly agree with that, right? It's totally, virtually, severely occluded. Uh, but and, you, and the left circumflex, same way. Yes, it is. Left circumflex is also greater than 90%. Uh, uh, you can't see that on the camera. 
And then the uh, LAD, I can't see the total occlusion of LAD. Maybe, did you see it? Yes, I think I took it for section. Uh, yeah, it's very point. narrow, very proximal. yeah. Gosh, greater than 90% right, at, right as it comes off the left main. Then it becomes a very small artery. Uh, so that's very interesting. Uh, angiographically, only one, quote, one vessel disease, pathologically, three vessel disease, and the interval between the angio, or the coronary uh, injections, and death was what? Approximately three months. Three months. Uh, were those angios reviewed here? I haven't, I haven't uh, heard from the radiologist or the cardiology department. They, they have been sent for, and they will be reviewed. The, uh, one of the interesting notes uh, in her chart from Portsmouth was that during this uh, angiographic uh, or the catheterization, the cardiac catheterization and the angiographic procedure, she developed uh, tremendous problems with vas or arteriospasm in her uh, right, apparently, radial artery and brachial artery during the procedure, and they had to pass several catheters. Hmm. So as a result of this, uh, she had to undergo a plastic procedure for revascularization of her right arm. So I don't know whether this lady was actually prone to uh, arteriospasm mm -hmm. for whatever reason, and maybe this, uh, this occlusion could be possibly the result of the angiographic studies. Well, the, all three major coronary arteries are severely narrowed, and they're narrowed very proximally. I have a suspicion. I think the problem with this bypass is that the artery into which it was inserted is extremely small, and there's simply not enough uh, artery uh, to run off. A bypass has to be in an artery that's big enough so that you get an adequate runoff, and I don't think this artery is of adequate size. Uh, whether it would have been a little more adequate size a little further down, uh, this is not uh, uh, the the insertion of the graph was not halfway down yet, uh, so maybe that would have played uh, some role. If it would have a little further down, uh, maybe that would have been advantageous. But but what this woman needed was uh, three bypass graphs, uh, not one. There has been mentioned in the past that if you have disease of only one coronary artery, that the prognosis, angiographically that is, uh, that, that's, uh, uh, that a good prognosis goes with that. But I've also seen another patient who was only 31 that had an LV uh, coronary study done at age 21 and, was there, and at that time was said to have single vessel disease, also just the LAD. And at necropsy at age 10 years later, all three coronary arteries were severely narrowed, severely narrowed. Now, in retrospect, in looking back at the CINES done at age 21 in that particular patient, on re-examination of those CINES, they really should not have been interpreted as single vessel disease. And I have a suspicion that in this patient, the same will also hold true, that when those CINES are re-examined, knowing that we're dealing with three vessel disease, that the observation of three vessel disease will also be made uh, radiographically. At least there, they, the other two will not be considered normal. Uh, so in essence, we have a 32-year-old woman who had the onset of ischemic chest pain only a few months before death. Uh, approximately nine months, actually. Nine months before death. Uh, no history of hypertension. She was of ideal body weight or? Uh, she was uh, rather heavy, but she was not obese. Uh, her blood pressure was normal. She did have type 2 hyperlipoproteinemia at one study, and I think that, uh, I would think that she was type 2 because this ascending aorta, I don't know whether you can see it or not, has an enormous amount of atherosclerotic placking in it. In addition to that, the aortic valve cusps are a little thicker than they ought to be for a 32-year-old woman. Uh, and type 2, at least if it's homozygous, homozygote type 2, that is both mother and father uh, have type 2 hyperlipoproteinemia. That's associated with atherosclerosis of the aortic valve cusps themselves and will lead actually to aortic stenosis. Now, this is a tremendous amount of atherosclerosis in ascending aorta for somebody 32. And I have a suspicion that she has more atherosclerosis in ascending aorta than she does in descending, uh, I mean, than in abdominal aorta. Uh, she, she certainly here has an old myocardial infarction and separating recent, if she underwent massage for six hours, it's very difficult to uh, uh, 
say that some of this uh, myocardial necrosis or hemorrhage is not traumatic in origin. But 32 years old, do we know? Do we know the type of her mother and father? No, we don't. It's possible that she was homozygote, but that uh, would be very unlikely. It's extremely rare for a homozygote to live 32 years. Most of them die before age 15. But this is a very interesting case, and no question, angios are underread. Would you have any comment uh, on her symptoms, the nocturnal angina at rest? I don't know. I believe people have, have uh, said that that occurs with the severest degrees of coronary disease. Uh, uh, the more, if, if angina occurs at rest, the more likely the, uh, you're dealing with extensive three-vessel disease, but I don't have any uh, direct information on that. But the right LAD and left circumflex are extremely narrowed right as they take off. So this is very proximal uh, narrowing here. Well, these are uh, uh, comments or uh, other questions on this case. She was not diabetic. No. So her only risk factor was a hyperlipidemia. That's correct. Boy. Okay, thank you very much. That's a fantastic case. Yeah,